Cyber threats have evolved in recent years to become a primary national security concern. And here to discuss cybersecurity's place in the modern threat landscape is Michael Chertoff. He's co-founder and executive chair of the Chertoff Group, but he was also the former Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, Michael, great to see you, and thanks for doing this. Look, I've taken, you know, we, we've known each other for a long time, but I've taken a glance at some of your comments about how the cyber dimensions of insecurity around our infrastructure are a hundredfold worse than when you were dealing with them, which then concerns me, because that means there's a curve that's like this, and I'm interested in whether you think we're gonna be able to bring that curve down. How are you looking at this question right now? How much trouble do you think we're in? Well, there's two, there's two. We have a lot of our operating systems are now connected to the internet. So the ability to actually not just convey information or data, but to actually engage in operating operational systems is now to some degree made vulnerable because it's connected. And what we've also seen is an increasing use by nation states of cyber attacks as a way of advancing their geopolitical agenda. The opening salvo of this was uh, over 10 years ago when the Russians began attacking Ukraine, including the infrastructure. And some years back, they shut down the Ukrainian energy grid for periods of time during the winter time. So we've seen this becoming more and more an area of conflict. And I have no reason to believe that's going to stop. And that means we have to have a broader and more vigorous set of defenses and also, to be honest, some deterrence against malevolent nation state actors. So let me just take that last comment. Deterrence against malevolent state-based actors. This is something that Tom Fanning, the CEO of Southern Company, talked about yesterday. My question to you is, that means sending a signal and making some of those players pay a price. And I'm just waiting for somebody to tell me we have that capacity in a serious way. Do we and are we doing that? Well, I don't have any doubt we have the capacity. And I think we've begun to be more active in taking a somewhat more, um, shall we say, aggressive position as a way of deterrent. So it began originally with naming and shaming. We've charged people from criminal groups and even some government actors with criminal offenses for cyber activity, although there's very little hope we're going to see them in an American courtroom. We've seen the use of economic sanctions. But more than that, in recent months, we've begun to see a more energetic response by the U.S. government. For example, after the Colonial Pipeline hack, the FBI was able to penetrate into the wallet in which the criminals kept the cryptocurrency ransom, and they actually stole back a good deal of that ransom. And that, I'm sure, hurt the criminal groups. We've also seen some attacks on servers and infrastructure that cyber hackers have been using to attack American targets, disabling them or damaging them. And again, that's a more energetic and more aggressive approach. Now, it's always tricky because you don't want to escalate to the point we get into a war. But I do think the general consensus is there has to be some payback or else you're giving the adversaries the ability to operate with impunity. You know, I'm going to try to get this question right, and I may screw it up, but I think you'll get what I'm trying to get at. Um, you have, when you were in the Department of Homeland Security, and we were very high alert on a lot of fronts, and I remember your, I think it was your successor, was Janet Napolitano your successor? So yes. Janet came on, and you know she did that. I was always interested in the, you know, TSA and you know the the trusted uh, traveler and trying to find ways that we move mm -hmm. from a hyper vigilant screen everyone to the to the gills approach to one where you could begin trying to distinguish between good Americans and, you know, sketchy Americans, if you will, or sketchy others, if you will. And and wondering, you know, in this cyber world where we're worried about threats, you look kind of, you know, Tom Fanning yesterday was pretty chilling uh, in some of the, his concerns. Um, and I think some of our other guests have been too, is how do we stay free? How do we maintain liberty? How do we maintain privacy in a world where some of those that want to look at how we secure ourselves, that the formula there doesn't sound um, as, as uh, free and, and full of liberty as some of us would like. 
Steve, I mean, the good news is in this case, we're not really screening the average American. We're looking at what's occurring on the And I'd say there are a number of different steps we need to take. First of all, we need to recognize this is about managing risk, not eliminating risk. Mm. Just as we've seen with the pandemic where people will get infected, but the critical issue is will they get very sick. In the cyber world, there's going to be a virus or some kind of an exploit that infects almost any uh, network. The question is, can you detect it early and shut it down before it does damage? And some of the things in the energy sector in particular that I think are important are checking the supply chain, making sure that your network managers and your providers of hardware and software have themselves vetted and examined what they're providing so that they're not a way station for criminals to penetrate your network, a building resilience, recognizing that if some part of your operating system is taken down, you need to have a backup plan. That becomes important as well. And then as we broaden out the so-called Internet of Things, where all these smart devices are connected to our energy grid, like thermostats, we need to make sure that they are being designed in a way that promotes at least a reasonable degree of security. And there was a case about 10 years ago in Washington where a private sector institution was hacked through a thermostat. Nowadays, when you get smart devices from your home, there needs to be a way of assuring that they meet certain reasonable standards of security, like updating and patching. So all of these are tools that would allow us to function with a reasonable degree of security, although not perfection. Um, Mike, you know, earlier this week, um, I think you know because I invited you, but you weren't able to make it. We had a dinner, and, and Suzanne Clark of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and I um, hosted a dinner, a bipartisan dinner of legislators, and really captains of industry from the tech industry, from the, the software platform industry, from you know lithium side of things. I mean, it was a broad cross section of people. And, and without attributing comments to anyone, um, I will say that the general vibe of that discussion was that America is just not keeping pace with the level of investment in things like AI, data, communications technologies um, that China is. And that we, and, and sometimes it's not the absolute level of investment, it's also the pace of investment. And I have to tell you that there was a, there was a pall over the discussion of people said, this has to turn around, we talk a lot about it, it's not happening. But that's also part of the cyber security picture. And I'd just love to get your take on it. When you meet legislators, when you meet your successors, are you hitting them over the head and saying, wake up? Yes, I mean, I'm very concerned about whether we are building capabilities and hardware and software to make sure we can continue to secure and operate our infrastructure. You know, I was an early uh, person who voiced concerns about Huawei being involved in the deployment of 5G technology because I was concerned that if the Chinese control the technology, they will have the ability to shut it off if we get into a fight with them. And in order to beat the Chinese at this game, we need to have something that's competitive. When I went to Europe, for example, a couple of years ago and argued to some officials over there that they should be careful with Huawei, their answer was, well, what do you have? You don't have an alternative. This is subsidized. It tends to be actually pretty uh, well uh, you know, run. How do you beat it? And so that convinced me we need to invest in Western and liberal democracy-based companies that can provide reasonable alternatives and can basically be price competitive. And that means creating a market, promoting investment, in much the same way that after the Cold War began, we began investing in technologies in the post-Sputnik period. And actually, that reminds me of what General Milley said the other day about hypersonics, that that's another almost Sputnik moment. So we need to wake up and build our industrial base to the next level. Well, listen, you know, part of building a more perfect union is thinking seriously and soberly about these big questions, and sometimes they're tough choices. I'm really grateful to Michael Chertoff, former Secretary of Homeland Security, co-founder and executive chair of the Chertoff Group. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be on, Steve. Keep it up.